Good morning. I almost forgot my mic again. <laughs> I caught it. I caught it before I got up here. Well, welcome. If you're a guest here, I'm Jonathan. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here at the Crossing Church. Uh, we have uh, gift bags in the back uh, that just kind of tell you about uh, the church and stuff. And so um, grab one of those on your way out. Um, and obviously, if you can find me, that'd be great. I'd love to chat with you. But um, this morning, we are finishing up our series in Hebrews. And so, it, you know, we, we basically started in chapter 11, <laughs> and uh, we're, we're going to be finishing up about halfway through chapter 12. Um, and that's, that's, our whole, that's, that's, the, that's the emphasis that we wanted to give in Hebrews, because we want to talk about faith. What is faith? And, and Gene last week did a, did a great job of uh, articulating, like, what, you know, what does endurance look like for us? And, um, and so what I'm going to do this morning is we're going we're gonna to back up a little bit, and we're going to start in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. So if you've got a Bible, you can open that up. The, screen, the screens are going to have the verses as well. If you've got it on your app or on your phone, feel free to pull that out. But um, we're going to be stepping through, and we're going to start in verse 2, and we're going to go through verse 14. And, and what we're going to see this morning is basically what we just sang about, Jesus. That like the author of Hebrews goes, you want to know how to endure? Look at Jesus. And, not, and we, and we got to be careful of this, right? Because it's very easy for us to say, well, he was the son of God. <laughs> and he was sinless. Of course he's going to endure, right? I mean, like, that's, that when I read that, I, I go, I, I'm not exactly sure what to do with that. But what we're going to see is some very tangible, really, really um, in-life ways that Jesus endures and how he models that for us. And so that's what we're going to look at today. So let me start uh, by praying. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for the opportunity um, to worship you. It's so incredible to gather together with um, this body of believers and just to sing your praises, to reflect on your word. And I pray that this morning, Father, that you would cause us to worship you in, in every aspect of our lives. It's not just it's not just learning. It's not just sitting here and listening uh, to somebody talk about scripture, but it's us drawing closer to your throne, us falling to our knees in worship of you and what you've done for us. And so I pray that you would bring us to that place this morning. Fill this place with your Holy Spirit, Father, and and uh, I pray that as I speak that you would um, just allow your Holy Spirit to do the work that it does. And that um, if there's something that you don't want me to say, God, I pray that you would help cause me to forget it and just to move past it. And if there's something that you want me to anchor on, I pray that you would cause me to do that as well, God, because this is all for your glory. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Oh, my. I'm sorry. I... Uh, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> Good morning. <laughs> I got this new fandangled watch uh, for my work, and so then now I get texts on it, which is awesome, unless I'm up here not trying to get texts for my work. Um, all right, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. He says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so, so the author of Hebrews points first, and, and Gene talked about this last week, right? He points to it and he says, it says looking to Jesus. That is, that is uh, you know, the, the present participle, I think. It's, it's like constantly, like ing, right? Like you're, you are constantly doing it. I think I'm right. I'm looking for some grammar. Come on, babe. Uh, you can do it. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure that's what it is, right? But like the, the it's, a, it's a, you are constantly doing it, looking, gazing, staring at Jesus. It's not, it's not just mental acquisition of like knowing what he did. That's not it. The first thing that the author of Hebrews does, he goes, let me tell you all these stories about all these people with this incredible faith. And then he says, okay, now keep looking at them. Keep looking at Jesus. Don't look at them. Look at Jesus. Look at what they were looking at, which is Jesus. 
right? We have completely lost it if we're going back and we're spending our time oogling over these people of faith in the past and like going, oh, these are just incredible, amazing people. No, no, Jesus is. And the things that they did, these people in chapter 11, they, they look to this hope, this promise. And what's, and what's the hope? It's that he's, he has defeated death. He conquered sin. He conquered our sin. And now he's seated at the right hand of God. And, and a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how significant that is for us, right? That he's interceding for us, that, that he loves us, that he cares for us, right? Like, like, man, what else do we need in this life? And so we can, we can sit and we can help, we can endure because we have a hope. We have a hope that this is an it. We have a hope that Christ has secured for us a room in heaven. That he has conquered the sin that we are all going to go commit this afternoon whether we want to or not, right? Like, like there is going to be sin in our lives and it's constant, but, but Christ once and for all conquered that sin. So we look at this from a finality perspective and we go, he did it. Can we endure based on that? We can, but there's more. There's more. And this is where we're going to be picking up this morning in verse uh, uh, three, chapter 12, verse three. He says, so he started with looking in verse two and now he says, consider. And that word consider means like ponder. Reflect, think. He says, consider, just consider him, Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So, what he's saying is, like, like our weariness and faint heartedness, like, like, we're going to get exhausted and tired, and so we should be doing what? Considering Jesus. Not just the hope of eternity that we have, but that we should be considering Jesus and how Jesus endured hostility from sinners. Who do you think is in the category of sinners? Well, that's pretty much everybody, right? I mean, if we're not careful, we might get into some bad theology and say, oh, those are, those are everybody that, like, didn't believe in Jesus. Well... Last I checked, everybody in this room is a sinner, right? At, at least I am. So, so what's this hostility from sinners he's talking about? And that's, and that's what we're supposed to consider. How did Jesus do this? How did Jesus deal with the hostility of those around him? Because I'm just throwing it out here. I would venture to guess that the things right now in our society that are causing the most angst is each other. <laughs> Am I right? I mean, there's, there's job stuff going on and there's other things going on in the background, but honestly, this, this apex of, of angst and frustration is because people are messy. We're messy. We're sinners. They're sinners. If you're in a marriage, man... <laughs> Two sinners living together. If you have friends, guess what? They're sinners. Like, like, we all just mess up. We all don't live the way that maybe on paper we would maybe describe ourselves. We fall short. And this is what he's saying is the people around Jesus fell short. They had the Son of God in their midst. And they fell short. And he describes it as hostility. And that word hostility can mean opposition. It can mean rebellion. So don't think, I think, because I think at first I go, oh, that's the Pharisees. And if, you've, and if you're, you've studied scripture a lot, you're like, totally, he's talking about the Pharisees. But I, I, think, we're, I think we're a little bit too naive to say that it's just the Pharisees. And so we're going to go through three of these stories that I think will help illuminate how Jesus responded and how he responded to these people in his life. And you guys, man, if there's something that we need to be equipped with, it's how are we to respond? What are we supposed to post? What are we supposed to say? And I'm not going to tell you <laughs> specifically. I'm going to point to Jesus. We're going to consider and ponder Jesus and go, how did he deal with people who maybe didn't see eye to eye with him? All right, so we're going to turn over to Mark chapter 8. 
And what we have is that the, the setting for this is that Jesus has literally just fed 4,000 people miraculously, right? Like this, like just happens. And then in verse 11, it says, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And so they go, show us something amazing. Now, he just did a miracle. <laughs> he just fed 4,000 people. How would you respond to that? I would immediately go, are you questioning like, my, my motives? Are you questioning who I am? Right? Like, I would take that personally. I, I totally would. And I, I think we all do. Are you, are you questioning me as a person? Because I can prove to you who I am, what I stand for, right? And, and certainly Jesus could have gone, did you not just see what just happened? Let me defend myself. And it even says that the Pharisees came and argued with him. So how does Jesus respond to that? Who it says in verse 12. He sighed deeply in his spirit. And said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he walked away. He didn't try to argue his point. He could have. I, I, wouldn't he have won the argument? <laughs> I, I don't even understand why he wouldn't have. I mean, if somebody comes to me and says, prove to me that Jesus is really the son of God. Like, I'm going to... I'm like, game, let's go. I'm like, let me, let, me, let me start rolling through this stuff. And, I, you know, and I'm not saying like we shouldn't do that, but, but what does Jesus do? There, there's, a, there's, there's a patience that he has, right? Because this is what we forget, and we're going to get into this a little bit more, but, but God is working in our lives. And maybe some of these Pharisees, maybe that included Paul. We don't know, but we knew that Paul was a Pharisee. I mean, we don't know who was in that group. And the Pharisees were kind of known to be like, hey, let's, let's, let's argue our points here, and then we'll figure out who's got the best. And, and, and so Jesus goes, well, you're not going to get a sign. It, and I think my interpretation in this text is that he goes, if you don't see this sign, you're, not, you're never going to see this sign. I think, I think Jesus is leaving this in the hands of God. He's leaving this to the Holy Spirit to go, man, that's a, this is a heart condition problem. This is sin. You guys, do we have the patience to say God is sovereign? And maybe somebody doesn't see eye to eye with me. Maybe it's, and we're not even talking about, you know, all the, all the, the, the issues that don't mean anything, right, <laughs> that we argue about, there are issues that, that are extremely meaningful to us. And maybe somebody doesn't seem to care as much as you do. Maybe somebody isn't quite as convicted of this area of ministry or, or this part of, of life and civilization and social society or whatever. Do we have patience with them? Do we have patience the way Jesus had patience and go, you know what, it's okay. We'll come back around to that here in a second. Turn over just two pages, uh, well, two chapters later in uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 35. Now, now that's from Pharisees, right? These, these are the people that you would expect maybe to argue with Jesus. Well, now you have James and John, and I think this one maybe hits a little bit more close to home with us. So look at chapter 10, verse 35. It says, James and John, these are the disciples of Jesus, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Oh, that's bold. And he said to them, What do you want from me? <laughs> and they said, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. So we got, we got to put ourselves into this context, right? Here's Jesus, the Son of God, who's coming to show the kingdom of heaven. 
and he's walking around with these disciples, he's spending all of his time with them. And, and this is how they respond. Hey, I want to be a king too. I want to be up there. Can I? Can I just secure a spot? the table of leadership? Can I, can I secure a position in this future kingdom? They had no idea even what they were asking for. You see, their minds were set in this world. They weren't, they weren't thinking of this eternal kingdom. They weren't thinking of the kingdom of heaven. They were thinking about here and now. And I think a lot of times, okay, all the times, pretty much all the time, we're thinking about here and now. We're thinking about issues in politics and our country and, and our situation and jobs and economy and, and uh, civil rights. And we're, I mean, we're thinking about all of these things, right? And, and it's not that they're bad things, but they're, they're, it's all we're thinking about. Look at what Jesus does. Turn over uh, just a couple verses later in verse 41. It says, And when the ten heard it, Right? The other ten disciples, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to him, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. What Jesus does here is he goes, he, I mean, he stops the record. He goes, stop. You guys are missing this. Your focus is wrong. Your focus is wrong. He had to remind them of their calling their responsibility, what they came, what they are there to do, which is to serve. And that's not what James and John were thinking. They were like, I want to, I want to, I've got an inside track <laughs> on this next kingdom, and I want to be at the right and I want to be at the left. And Jesus goes, No, don't forget your calling. Remember, he reminds them, like, there's more to this. There's more to this than, than what you are focused on. And the, the reality is, is what ends up happening is bitter infighting, right? I mean, you could imagine that, that Jesus is like, you guys are, why would you say that in front of the 10, <laughs> right? Like, why would you say that? You just revealed like sin in your life and you, you, you spit it out of your mouth and now everybody's mad at you because you said what you actually felt, <laughs> And I think at that point, Jesus is like, you know, he's like, you guys, get over here. Come here. Stop fighting. We're called to serve. And I think we need to remind each other of that. What's our calling? What are we here to do? All these other things, it doesn't mean that they don't matter. It just means that we have, above all of those things, a calling that supersedes all of it. All of it. Now turn over to Luke chapter 22 in verse 59. You guys are familiar with this one. This is Peter rejecting Jesus. It says in verse 59, after... And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with you. He too is a Galilean. Talking about Peter, this is like Jesus is being arrested. And Jesus has already told Peter he's going to deny him three times. And so this is the last one here. And Peter said in verse 60, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. Saying, I don't even know who this Jesus is. couldn't even imagine that type of backstabbing, that kind of just complete rejection. Jesus is like, I told you this was going to happen. And the Lord turned 
and looked at Peter. Jesus never says anything. He just looks at him. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. What was the look? This is a lot of, lots of interpretation here. Knowing who Jesus is as the Son of God, I don't think this is Jesus going, I can't believe you did this, right? Like he knew this was going to happen. I think it was a look of love. I think it was Jesus looking at Peter going, it's okay. I love you. And when we go back to John uh, chapter 21, we, we read of Jesus after his resurrection going to Peter and, and restoring that relationship and going, dude, I still love you. It's okay. It's your sin. It's your sin that did that. You see, I, and I think this is part, we forget that we're all sinful. We forget that our friends and our family and our spouses and our coworkers, we're all wrapped up in sin. And we're called to love. We're called to love, to understand that, man, like they're not doing the things that, that they really want to do. They are slaves to their sin. Are you a slave to your sin? Because I am. Like, I respond in ways that I would never, I would never uh, plan to. I react. I respond in ways with my, especially my daughters, that I wouldn't want to, right? I think ever, all of us go through that. And so when, when that. But then when that happens to us, we go, I can't believe you would do that. And we go, why, why, why can't you believe that? <laughs> We're all sinners. It seems very logical, that somebody would do this. And, and I think from Jesus' perspective, he goes, it's very logical. I know that you're going to deny me because you're going to be afraid of your life. You're going to be afraid for your life. You're going to be afraid, and you're not going to want to confess that you know me. And I think for us in our relationships as well, man, we, that happens. People are going, people are going to let us down. And maybe, maybe we thought that people were a certain way because we just didn't really know them well enough. But then once we know them, we're like, man, actually sin is pretty deep in your life. And then maybe, maybe they're looking at us going, man, sin's pretty deep in your life too. And you're like, yeah, we're all, we're all messed up here. But what are we called to do? What does Jesus do? He loves Peter in the midst of that. Okay, so the author of Hebrews says, consider Jesus, consider how he responded to these people being hostile in his life. Consider it, ponder it, and then what are you going to do? What are you going to do when people are hostile to you, to what your, your views are, to what you think about the world? Because here's the reality. Man, we all come from a different background. We all have different experiences. And so we're all going to interpret things differently. It's actually a very beautiful creation that God has made. Thank God we're not all the same person. That, I don't even know what that would look like, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be good probably. You know, this is beautiful, right? Because we all come at things from a different perspective. And so if, if somebody doesn't see it from our perspective, we immediately want to defend ourselves and our egos and say, no, 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 I'm right on this. You see, we're, we're more concerned about being right than being righteous, we're more concerned about proving our point than we are concerned about discipling others and pointing to Christ. You see, we need a reminder of what our calling is. What are we here to do? And, and so the author of Hebrews goes on, in, uh, and look at this, in chapter 12, verse 5. He says, Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? And then he quotes, he says, uh, quotes Proverbs. He says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. So what he's saying is, why are you going to have to endure all of these sinful people? <laughs> Why does God have us enduring these relationships that are messy and these people that backstab us and let us down 
unmet expectations, unfulfilled obligations. It's just frustrating. And as you get to know them, you're like, man, you think things that I just don't think. And I don't like it. (laughs) It's for discipline. God is disciplining us, you guys. He's he's conforming us to the image and likeness of his son. And so, man, if if we were just, if everybody agreed with us, man, that, I mean, as much as I would like everybody to agree with me, it would be very dangerous for me because I wouldn't change, right? God wouldn't be able to, to mold me and shape me. And it's the same for all of us. It's a good thing. It's a good thing when somebody challenges your assumptions it's a good thing when somebody says, actually, I see this differently because I have this experience. And you go, wow, I don't have that experience. You see, God is shaping us. He's disciplining us. And then look down what it says in verse 11. It says, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, look at what it says. It yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. That's the result that, you know why that person is in your life that's just a thorn in your side and always bugging you and, and it's frustrating and it's difficult? Because God is trying to produce fruit of righteousness. And what does that fruit look like? Peace. Oh, how far we are from this. Peace. That's the end result of this. You guys connecting these things? God puts hostile sinners in your life. You are a sinner so that he can discipline you and so that you can endure through this so that what? You will produce peaceful fruit. That's what God wants to do. And that is not what's happening. Would you agree? I mean, throughout the world, I mean, throughout the the world, the country, right? Like within our church, like it's just, and I'm with you. Like, I want to prove my point. I think I know what's right. We all have our opinions, but the reality is, is that we are called to produce peace. That's the fruit of righteousness, So when we respond as as followers of Christ, we ought to be looking to Christ and going, how did he respond? And then we ought to be thinking, how do I respond in this situation? Do I respond because I want to promote peace? Or do I respond because I want to prove my point? Guys, I I literally ask Melissa every week, can I post this? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is the conversation we have. I'm, uh, so I'm with you here. I just, she just has really good control <laughs> of me. <laughs> She's like, no. I'm like, all right, sounds good. And she has let me do one, but it was, a very, it was a good one. But that's why you don't hear from me, because I'm like, I just, uh, I have a lot of opinions, and I don't want any of you to know them. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality. Why? Why? Because then there's going to be a conflict. There's going to be something other than the cross. There's going to be something other than Jesus that, is, that creates the unity in us or the disunity in us. Because we're sinful. I, honestly, I don't want to... I mean, well, I, you know, I don't know. I don't want to know all the details of, you know, your guys... I, I, that's not true. I do, but, but it's a challenge for me, honestly. It's a challenge because we're called to love. We're called to peace. And some of you in here, I'm going to look as quick as I can to everybody, okay? Some of you I don't agree with. Politically, economically, who cares? Who cares? It's okay. Because our responsibility is to produce peace. Our responsibility is to remind each other of our calling, which is to communicate the gospel to the world and to shine the light that, that's our responsibility, guys. And look at what it says in verse 12. And so uh, uh, the author of Hebrews picks up on this endurance, this race, this athletic thing, and he says, therefore, lift your drooping hands, right? So he's talking like running, and I don't know if, you know how like 
uh, you know, when you're running, you got to like kind of shake them out, right? And so the, the picture of this, like you can't even get your arms up. He says, lift up your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. And then look at what he says in verse 14. Strive for peace with everyone. That's it. God's word says, strive for peace with everyone. Any questions? <laughs> doesn't say with people that agree with you. It doesn't say that people that vote like you. It doesn't say that people that are from your same country. It doesn't say that people that have the same language. It doesn't, it doesn't say any of that stuff. It says everyone. And then it says, strive for peace with everyone and for holiness, the holiness. Now, this is important. That doesn't mean perfection. And I think, you know, I, when we read that at first, I think we all think like holy rollers and we think uh, that's somebody who thinks that they're perfect and all that. That's not what that means. That means being set apart for God's purposes. That's, that's what that means. So we, we should be striving for peace and we should be striving to be set apart. We should be striving to be the ones that are swimming upstream. We should be striving to be the ones who live like Christ. We are striving to be the ones that point to our God in heaven who has secured salvation for us. That's what we should be pointing to. And then look at what it says. Without which no one will see the Lord. You guys, you guys get that? Read that whole thing. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to be looking to Jesus, to be considering and pondering our Savior and going, how do I live for peace? And so when we're getting ready... <laughs> to post, when we're getting ready to say something, when we're getting ready and, and those emotions well up in us and we're, we're frustrated and, and they're hostile to us and they become our adversaries and in our mind we're like, I don't like them. We need to be reminded of this, that it's, it's through how we live and act and love and remind each other that we are showing the love of God and we are revealing Christ to the world. God intends to use us. I, I, had this, um, I had this great opportunity when I was down in Miami last week. Um, I had this guy that, that, was, that I was uh, chatting with. And, um, and, and I, I think one of the, one of the I, I think one of the coolest arguments for how we are to live as the body of Christ is that if, if it was about our salvation, if it was just about my individual salvation, then the second I believed, I would be in heaven. If, if that's all it's about, if it's about you growing closer to Christ, if it's about you just living your life and becoming saved, then why are you here? Why are you still alive? Because... God's plan in his infinite wisdom and unfathomable love has chosen to use sinners like us to communicate the gospel to the world. Just think through that for a second. You guys get that? Like, like that's our responsibility. We are tools in the hands of God to go and to strive for peace and for holiness so that the world will see him. There is a response. So when we're, when we're living and we're just responding to people and we're just living the day as however we want, we're not on mission. We're not making disciples. We're not doing the very thing that we were created to do. Every breath that we have was created for this express purpose. The 
the verse isn't going to be up there, but I want to talk to it. It says in verse 15, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. The author of Hebrews like doubles down here. He's like, not only will no one see the Lord, he tells us, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. That does not mean that we are the uh, deliverers of the grace of God, okay? Like that, that is in no means, we could not handle that, okay? That is not our responsibility. But what he's saying, and he goes on to talk about this root of bitterness that can, that can, that's a virus, not, I mean, <laughs> that's a virus, like a, like a virus that can infect all of us, bitterness, and it can affect how people see Christ. Our response, our lives, are put at the foot of the altar. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.20. It says, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. That's how God is communicating to this world. I mean, he, he's given us the, the, his word, and our job is to go, let's take this and let's put this into practice, and let's go live and communicate peace and love and reminding each other of this heavenly calling we have. That's our responsibility. And so we must strive for peace with everyone. If not, you might as well just put that up on the dusty shelf and leave it. Because the worst thing we can do is to create bitterness and make it so that, that people fail to obtain the grace of God because we have become an obstacle instead of a means of grace that God uses to sh show his glory. You guys get that? So all of this in, in the entire book of Hebrews, right? And I hope you guys read it. I don't know. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna have you guys raise your hand. But I hope you guys read. It. And if you haven't, seriously, finish. It's not long. You read more on your, you know, whatever, on your news feed or what, right? Like, come on. It doesn't take long. Read the book of Hebrews because this is how he's in. And he's like, man, this is what faith is. Faith endures. That's why we can endure. That's the only way we can endure. By the way, is if we are striving for peace. Because if that's not our path, if it's bitterness, we're not going to endure. We're not going to endure and we're not going to be useful to God. So let's encourage each other. Let's, let's do exactly what Jesus did, right? Let's be patient. Let's remind each other of our calling and let's love each other. And I don't mean just the people that you agree with. Let's strive for peace with everyone. Let me pray.